Good afternoon and welcome to the 171st AGM of Ipswich Building Society. I'm Fiona Ryder, the Society's Senior Independent Director, and it's my pleasure to welcome you today. This is, for the second time in a row, a very different AGM as a direct result of the pandemic and the lockdown rules. We have constructed an AGM for you which allows us to comply with all the relevant legislation, but which also ensures that our members' voices are well and truly heard, both in the voting that has taken place before the AGM and also by fully exploring the questions raised by members. A recording of this AGM, along with all the questions raised and the answers given by the board, will be published on our website. This year, this is all supported by three videos which we have prepared for members and which will form part of today's meeting and will also be available on the website. The first video is a review of the year from Alan Harris, Chairman of the Society. The second allows Richard Norrington, our CEO, to showcase the Society's developments, talk about our activities and look ahead to our rebranding later in the year. And the third video, which we will show you at the end of today's proceedings, is all about our name change to Suffolk Building Society. The video celebrates everything that makes your society special and gives you a sneak preview of our new corporate identity. So that sets the scene for the next 30 minutes or so. Can I firstly now hand over to Alan Harris, who as chairman will guide us through the AGM proceedings. Thank you very much, Fiona, and good afternoon, everyone. Present today, either in person in Ipswich or by video conference, are the board of directors, the executive management team, including our company secretary, Rebecca Newman, and of course, as you've heard, Richard Norrington, our chief executive. Also present are a large enough group of members to ensure compliance with the requirements of our articles and constitution. So, to the agenda. This meeting is required to present the annual report and accounts and ask your approval for these and for the appointment and reappointment of directors and our auditors and to approve the remuneration report. Also this year to approve an amendment as well to one of our rules to specifically allow for virtual meetings should they be necessary in the future. Now some of the AGM formalities. Firstly, the minutes of the annual general meeting held on the 25th of March 2020 have been read and signed by me as the chairman of that meeting. These will be available online for anyone who wishes to read them. But now can I pause and ask the team to play the video that Fiona has just referred to. I prepared this earlier and in it, I reflect on the performance of the society for the year ended 30th of November 2020. Mm -hmm. 2020 will always be remembered as the year of COVID-19 and what a difficult year it created for everyone. For our own team, for our members and for our intermediary partners. For me, though, I can see how the pandemic has really been all about the effect on people. It has brought concerns about health and well-being for many of our members, and it's had a significant economic impact on them as well. But just as we've seen the wonderful way in which key workers throughout the country have kept us all looked after and cared for, then, in a similar way, all our people in the society have continued to deliver exceptional service to members. In fact, the government's new rules have allowed us to serve our members in many new ways. A good example is with payment deferral applications. We have processed 574 of these in the year, which have helped to make personal finances for members just that little bit easier to manage. We have also successfully introduced new ways of working, including investing in key capabilities to enable our teams to serve members and partners safely. Over 83% of our head office colleagues have been able to work from home, which has then allowed safe distancing for those in the team who've remained in our offices. 
None of our employees have been furloughed and we've worked closely with our team members to ensure that everyone has received strong levels of support through this time of uncertainty and change. I've reported to members before on the importance of our risk management capabilities and planning. These were never more important than last year as our resilience was tested at every level. So what did we actually do? Well, we adapted procedures and found new ways of working together. And in making these plans, the society's risk management framework was an immense asset. As we acted in response to the requirements of both our regulators and of course the pandemic itself. It's also important to note that delivering quality service in the pandemic would not have been possible without the investments in technology that we've made in recent years. These have been essential to support more effective remote working, allowing team members to stay connected whilst working apart. And also, all of our branches and head office buildings were made COVID secure through the introduction of key safety measures across all of our sites. So, looking back, we do feel we thoroughly tested the resilience of the business. But despite all the difficulties, I can report that as well as the society remaining firmly open for business, we've also seen continued growth in both mortgages and savings, and also that we've been able to improve our capital position. I'd like now to particularly identify some highlights of the year. Firstly, we reported increased mortgage completions of £123 million and our more targeted approach again delivered a strong net interest margin of 1.8%. As a result, the total mortgage book increased to £568 million at year end. Secondly, member savings balances increased by £21 million and that took overall deposits to a high of £624 million. Also, despite the pressures of the pandemic, we recorded continued supportive feedback from members. The Society's overall net promoter score held firm at 82. As I've already mentioned, we were able to help many members with mortgage payment holidays, but as usual, our very sensible membership have responded well to the situation and we recorded a good arrears performance by the end of the year. And finally, I can report that your society's capital and liquidity continues to be strong. The leverage ratio is holding at 5.1% and the liquidity coverage ratio is at 195%, considerably above the minimum requirement. Now, can I give a brief update on aspects of our governments? And the first thing to say is that in such a difficult year, it has been absolutely right that we've maintained a strong focus on governance and sound management. Our governance and oversight are all about ensuring that the society takes risks within appetite and that these risks are understood and are effectively managed. In this respect, a strong and effective board is essential. And during the year, a number of changes took place on the board. We said goodbye to our Deputy Chairman, Peter Elcock, who left the board in March 2020. Peter joined the board in 2014 and has been a strong influence in building the modern Ipswich. The board has been strengthened with two new appointments. Both joined us during the pandemic and despite this are already adding immense value to the society's governance. In April, we were delighted to welcome Sean Hill to the board as a non-executive director. Sean was a partner at KPMG for many years, including over 20 years as a financial services tax partner, advising a broad range of financial institutions. 
Then in June, we welcomed Paul Johnson as our new finance director. Paul brings with him considerable and very relevant experience, having held a number of senior roles in UK financial service organisations. Now, to conclude this review, a brief look ahead from me to what the rest of 2021 may hold for us. There is no doubt that the pandemic will affect us all for many months to come, and so we do anticipate another challenging environment. In the UK, overall savings balances continue to grow as spending is restricted in the pandemic. And here at the Ipswich, we do see a similar position as we continue to stay true to our mission, which is to provide a safe home for members' savings. In the housing market, it is difficult to predict the level of consumer confidence. It has definitely been boosted by the announcement of the stamp duty holiday, as well as the release of post lockdown related demand. But in the economy overall, job insecurity will continue to be a factor, and a rise in unemployment is one of the biggest potential risks to the stability of the property market this year even though the government's furlough scheme will be extended to September. And the tapering off of the stamp duty holiday deadline for another three months will also bring some welcome stability. Looking ahead, though, there are significant concerns around job security. And whilst many members will remain confident in their own personal finances, we will continue to support those who face payment difficulties. My final reflection on the year takes me back to where I began this review, thinking about people. And my overriding conclusion is that for a committed mutual, the building society business model, as represented here at the Ipswich, has shone through in the extraordinary time of the pandemic. We have opened our branches, we've maintained service levels to our intermediary partners, and we've been prominent in supporting our communities. We have done so thanks to the people who make Ipswich Building Society so special, our staff and management in all the teams throughout the business. They have stepped up and they've made a difference. They've made a difference to each other and to our members. So I'd like to close this review by thanking, firstly, all my colleagues on the board for their hard work and unstinting support. But most especially, thank this society's employees for their valued personal and team contributions. It has been an extraordinary year, and it's been a year in which you have done extraordinary things. Thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for watching and listening to my review. That video, together with the others we will see today, will be available online for all of our members to review. Can I now formally commend the annual report and accounts to this AGM? Before concluding the formal elements of today's meeting, it's right that we again spend time reviewing members' questions to this AGM. Can I therefore hand back to Fiona to lead this review? Thanks, Alan. We've had 17 questions in writing. All of these have had individual replies and are available to read on our website. We've reviewed all the questions and so far there are some key themes that I'd like to pick up on now and then ask individual members of the board to summarise these and the answers we've given. Some specific themes have emerged. Firstly, we've had several questions relating to digital account access and management. Members have asked, when will we introduce digital access to accounts over the internet and a mobile app? Richard, can you answer this question? Uh, yes, of course, Fiona. So I can confirm that digital access remains a key priority for the board and is one of our corporate objectives. We are conscious of the ever growing need for an online service to respond to member requirements and needs. However, it is also vital that it integrates with our core IT operating platform and is cyber resilient. We are therefore on a digital journey to ensure that the society has in place the necessary IT infrastructure to support a digital offering. 
The first part of our digital journey involves refreshing our digital mortgage origination platform. And we expect work to begin on an online savings offering towards the end of this year with a go live date to members in the second half of 2022. And we look forward to integrating a digital offering into our already successful network of nine branches across the county of Suffolk. Thanks, Richard. And another member has asked whether or not they can deposit by post and withdraw by backs and not a cheque. Yes, so Fiona, we, um, we do accept cheques by post. Um, um, a member can include their passbook for updating um, or will be sent a receipt with the passbook being updated when they next visit their local branch. Uh, members can transfer up to £25,000 per day free of charge. Um, to a previously nominated bank or building society current account in their name. Uh, funds are received by the end of the next bank working day. Transfers over £25,000 will be sent by CHAPS and are subject to a £25 charge. Thank you. We've had a question relating to negative interest rates. If the Bank of England base rate turns negative, Will we introduce negative interest rates for savers? I'd like to ask Paul Johnson, our Chief Financial Officer, to answer this one for us. Okay, thanks, Fiona, of course. Um, so we constantly review the products and rates we offer for both mortgages and savings very carefully uh, as part of our overall corporate strategy. In the event of uh, negative bank rates, rates, whilst we have no intention to charge savers at the moment, we, along with other financial institutions, would review the market conditions at the time. Thank you. Now, a member has asked if there any changes to mortgage lending to overseas residents as a result of Brexit. And another member has asked whether our lending criteria has become stricter during the pandemic and if that has meant a loss of business. Lee Gladwell, our Chief Commercial Officer, will answer these two questions and additionally outline the Society's mortgage growth strategy. Yes, thank you. Um, so the first question relating to uh, Brexit, there has now been some progress in discussions with the EU relating to financial services, but we're still waiting to see how some of the more detailed negotiations progress. And we're also waiting for the formal memorandum of understanding to enable us to assess the impact on our lending. In the meantime, though, we're very active in the expat mortgage market, and we're hopeful that a satisfactory agreement will be reached. So we're continuing to lend to UK applicants who live in the EU. On the second question um, regarding our um, lending during the pandemic, as well as using the skills and experience of our underwriters, we have, like a lot of other UK lenders, adapted our lending criteria as the pandemic has, uh, has developed to ensure that we continue to lend prudently. But that hasn't uh, resulted in a loss of business. And in fact, um, by the end of last year, we'd achieved £45.5 million pounds worth of net lending, and we finished the year with a record mortgage pipeline of £87.5 million. Pounds. Um, I think the final point was about how do we continue that growth, and our future mortgage growth strategy will be supported by several specific developments, which include the, um, a, a new mortgage origination platform and the relaunch of our brand, and our new website, but it will also be based on excelling at the things that we're already known for. And that includes specializing in, in niche markets, maintaining a very wide distribution across our direct mortgage customers, but also our intermediary market, our manual underwriting, and also generally being a lender that is accessible and keen to do business and committed to offering a really great customer service. Thank you. Now, several members have questioned our AGM format for this year. I'd like to invite Rebecca Newman, our Chief of Staff and Company Secretary, to explain why the decision was taken to pre-record our AGM rather than stream live, and whether the format of the meeting and resolutions passed today are valid. Thank you, Fiona. Firstly, yes, the Society believes that our AGM this year is valid. It is being conducted in accordance with the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act, which was legislation that was passed to enable organisations to hold statutory meetings in light of COVID restrictions. A number of organisations have invested in technology to allow for real-time AGMs. However, there is a cost associated with that and the Society is always mindful of ensuring the best use of members' funds. 
But as technology develops and as the society considers the future format of meetings, we will of course keep that under review. Thank you. And Rebecca, can you confirm that all the questions asked by members and associated responses will appear unedited on the website? I can. Thank you. Now, there are several questions from a member relating to executive pay, particularly for the chief executive and the format of the remuneration committee's report in the annual accounts. I'd like to invite Elaine Lenk, Chair of Remco, to respond. Thank you. Thank you. The remuneration committee considers executive pay across a multitude of factors and in depth before making decisions. The salary awarded to the chief executive officer reflects the overall benchmarking of responsibilities afforded to the CEO of a modern financial services firm. The society exercises the highest quality standards in, standards in relation to recruitment for which competition is fierce. We have recent market experience in recruitment of senior executives, which confirms our market positioning. The society is happy that the overall remuneration package for the CEO is absolutely consistent with the current market rates for such roles and has recently conducted an external benchmarking exercise. I can confirm that the current composition of the remuneration committee is comprised solely of non-executive directors who are also members of the society with a wide range of skills and experience to provide sufficient cognitive diversity. Thank you, Elaine. One member has queried the reason for the society's plan name change and the cost associated with this. Richard, could you provide a response? Yeah, sure. Um, so in uh, 2020, the society's members voted overwhelmingly in favour of changing the society's name to Soft Building Society. Uh, the, the, the change will increase the accessibility of the society going forward. And as a member owned organisation, we are always cost conscious. And that is why we have a full project in place to minimise any costs associated with this change, including such items as running down old stocks of current branding material, that sort of thing. Thank you. A member has questioned the board's decision to appoint BDO as auditors and whether their corporate ethics are commensurate with those of a community based building society. I'd like to ask Steve Liddell, as chair of audit, to answer this, please. Thank you, Fiona. The society recently changed external auditors as a result of a retendering process, and BDO have just completed their first annual audit. BDO audits a number of comparable societies to the Ipswich Building Society and we've been happy with the, with the service they provided to us since their date of appointment. I believe the question regarding corporate ethics relates to BDO's decision to initially retain and then subsequently return furlough payments. Um, we believe that that was a commercial decision for them and I understand they've now responded directly to the members' inquiries. Thanks, Steve. We've received a question relating to the closure of our Felixstowe branch. Will the board review this decision and could the society set up an advice centre in its stead on a weekly basis? Richard, can I ask you to respond? Yes. Um, so in 2020, unfortunately, and after much careful consideration, the society made the decision to close the Felixstowe agency. Uh, the majority of our members who used the service had continued to visit us at one of our other nearby branches, and in particular in Woodbridge and in Ravenswood branches. Uh, it is unlikely that the society will revisit the decision to reopen the agency. However, we are committed to maintaining a face to face presence for our members, and we are open to ideas as to how that might be achieved in the future. Of course, members are always welcome to contact us. Uh, with any query or for any advice, either at any one of our nine branches or in the normal way, so by telephone, by email or in writing. Great, thanks Richard. And finally, we've had many positive comments made about our staff and offices going the extra mile during COVID, providing high levels of care and dedication during the pandemic. I'd like to ask Ian Brighton, our Chief Operating Officer, to comment on staff operations and procedures over the last year. Many thanks, Fiona. We are really grateful and pleased with how our staff have adapted to the changes in working practices in line with the COVID restrictions, ensuring that the society has been able to continue 
to serve its members during these difficult times. Thanks to our previous investment in technology, we have been able to support 80% of our head office staff to work remotely. And by ensuring that our premises are COVID secure, we have been able to continue to maintain the opening of our branches throughout this period. We have continued to support our members with their transactions, face-to-face -face discussions, and account openings when the COVID restrictions have allowed in a safe and secure environment, but still maintaining our personal approach, which our members have come to expect. During the pandemic, we have implemented new and easier ways for our members to transact on their savings account with the introduction of electronic payments, and we have adapted our mortgage process during the property lockdown so that we could still continue to process our members' mortgage applications. And in accordance with the Financial Conduct Authority's request, within 24 hours, we had implemented the ability for our mortgage members to take a mortgage payment deferral where COVID had impacted their financial situation. Our appreciation goes out to all of the society staff who have done a tremendous job in adapting to this change and continue to support all of our members throughout this period. Thanks, Ian. So just to confirm again, all the questions and answers and the full video recording of today's proceedings are being made available on the Society's website. Before handing back to the Chairman to conclude the formalities of the AGM, can I ask the team to play our second video in which Richard Norrington, our Chief Executive, presents his thoughts on what has been a difficult, busy and highly unusual year for him and the team. Hello and welcome to my report on the Society's developments during the year and our upcoming plans across 2021 and 2022. This is a somewhat different review to previous years. At the time of our last AGM, we were then starting the first lockdown phase, and I don't think anyone could have predicted how the rest of 2020 and into 2021 would have played out. It goes without saying it's been a year of change and a year when we have all needed to adapt to change, both personally and professionally. One thing I'm incredibly proud of is the way that society employees have reacted. I would like to start by thanking them all for their commitment and resilience to the society, and also stress that we have, of course, supported them through the difficult months of the pandemic. Our head office staff remain working from home where they can, that is obviously not possible in our branch network, but we have put in additional safety measures to safeguard our employees and our visiting members. We have protective screens in branches, the now ubiquitous anti-back stations, and of course, rigorous cleaning procedures. We have been committed to keeping branch facilities open as an essential service and in line with government guidelines, have asked members to limit their visits to essential transactions only. I'm very pleased how our members have supported the society throughout the pandemic. We have seen high volumes of business and in fact, we opened 3000 new savings accounts and welcomed nearly 1500 new savers to the society in our financial year. So a warm welcome to our new members. In September, we started to see the first tranche of child trust funds mature as the initial wave of account holders reached their 18th birthday and were able to access their funds. This is a significant activity as we have a large number of child trust fund holders and we will be contacting them all ahead of their 18th birthdays to make them aware of the options available to them. This work will continue until 2029. A key improvement we have made during the year for our savings members was the rollout of electronic withdrawals. This means that members can quickly move money into a nominated current account and offers an alternative option to cash withdrawals and check payments. 
I do hope our savings members will take advantage of an easier, safer and free way to move money. During the year, we couldn't carry out our usual wide range of exclusive member events across Suffolk or hold any of our community activities and charity fundraisers in branch. One of the things I'm very proud of is the large exterior wall of our Hadley branch and it was put to good use by the Hadley Royal British Legion, hosting two murals, one for the 75th anniversary of VE Day in May, and the second for the 75th anniversary of VJ Day later in August. In the last couple of months, a new mural has been put up, celebrating the late Captain Sir Tom Moore, paying tribute to what he achieved in 2020 to raise money for the NHS. And I think you'll agree how he kept our spirits up in difficult times. Please do take a look at our social media channels to see this wonderful mural. Speaking of supporting local communities, we continued our work with the Suffolk Community Foundation, assisting with their Rebuilding Local Lives appeal. Those of you based in Suffolk might have heard about this on BBC Radio Suffolk. This appeal is aimed at reaching the most vulnerable in the county with a message of stay warm, stay well and stay connected. I am pleased that in our branches we were able to collect donations totalling over £2,000. Through our branches we were also able to help the Hearing Care Centre with their initiative for people with hearing loss who, due to the mandatory wearing of face masks, have found it difficult to lip read when they are out and about. Our branches have a supply of the Please Speak Clearly badges to alert people that the wearer has hearing loss and may need additional support. These badges are still available, so please do pick one up if you or someone you know would find it beneficial. During 2020, we also struck up a partnership with Shop Suffolk. This is an online platform which promotes local retailers, keeping the money circulating within the county's local economy and having a positive impact on employment. This showcases Suffolk retailers who could really do with our support through these difficult months. So do give Shop Suffolk a look. Now on the mortgage side of things, as you may be aware, Measures came in in March last year via the Financial Conduct Authority to support borrowers whose finances have been affected by the pandemic, offering mortgage payment deferrals. Through this initiative, we were able to help 574 borrowers. At the end of a financial year in November, 98.6% of borrowers who had taken up a payment deferral had resumed their regular payments so we were pleased to offer such support when it was needed most. In tandem with this, when the pandemic first hit, the property market came to a halt as valuers were not able to get out and value properties, meaning lenders could not give the assurances they needed to lend the funds requested. Once activity was able to resume, we were pleased to see the market soon pick up. One thing which became apparent was that lenders were adapting to the economic conditions and higher loan to value deals were in short supply. This was due in the most part to uncertainty over property prices and also the effect of the pandemic on people's finances and their potential ability to repay a mortgage loan. However, we were keen to stay in the mortgage market with a reduced product range and witnessed unprecedented demand. We were especially careful to monitor market conditions and then make swift but considered decisions on when to withdraw and when to re-enter with a limited range of products. Through this careful, balanced approach, it is a great testament to the society's adaptability that we were able to grow our mortgage book by 9% during our financial year, backed by the amazing efforts put in by our employees. That is, the underwriters, mortgage consultants, 
sales and lending support teams, and also our intermediary division who work with our broker partners. In fact, through these broker partners, we actually received 92% of all our mortgage applications during the year. So they are an important relationship to us and offer consumers an independent, expert approach when seeking a mortgage. Obviously, the way we interacted with these intermediaries changed during the year, making use of video calling and by attending virtual conferences. We also looked at how we could shape our sales and support teams internally to better suit our brokers' requirements. We were able to strike up three new partnerships during the year to increase the availability of our mortgages to intermediaries, joining the lender panels at Brilliant Solutions, TMA and Dynamo. One of the overriding themes of this year has been change and how the society has adapted to change. Adapted to the evolving market, but also we have protected and grown our business. Our core aim remains to ensure the society is run prudently, and this is a long term strategy. To that effect, we are making good progress on the digital transformation of our business, which is well underway with core projects, namely an online mortgage origination platform. Secondly, digital savings, which we know our members have been asking for for some time. As part of our corporate plan, Work is underway on both of these projects and our mortgage origination platform is expected to launch late in 2021 and digital savings then becoming focus. Now, this financial year, 2020 to 2021, will see a landmark event and one which you may already be aware of. At our AGM last year, members voted to approve a name change to Suffolk Building Society. In fact, of the votes received, the proposal achieved a 93% approval rating, which is a great response. We are continuing to work towards implementing this at the appropriate time, with our current plan being to roll out in October this year, subject to the status of the pandemic. You will see and hear more about this later on in the meeting, in particular, this new name and the new look and feel will give us an opportunity to be more relevant in our wider county and beyond. It will increase our geographic reach and also keep us true to our roots, for we were founded as the Ipswich and Suffolk. Fundamentally, we must and will adapt our brand so it works just as well in person and in print as it does online. As we continue to progress with our digital strategy. This name change is crucial to the future and sustainability of the society, and I thank our members who voted to make that decision. Finally, I remain grateful for the support of our members, intermediaries and our staff. The society would not be where it is today without that support and dedication, especially during a difficult, unpredictable and undeniably tough 12 months. Thank you all. Well, thank you very much, Richard. Before moving on to the resolutions before this AGM, I am delighted to be able to announce the winners today of the David Coe Award. This award is presented to members of staff who have demonstrated excellent customer care and, and focus, which exceeds the normal requirements of their role. This year, we considered some incredibly strong nominations and in such a difficult year when customer service was at the forefront during the pandemic, it is absolutely right that the executive and the board have decided exceptionally to make the award to two winners. Full details of the winners and their achievements are included on the website. So today, I'll simply say thank you to these individuals on behalf of the board. You have been tremendous and we thank you very much. The winners of the David Coe Award for Exceptional Customer Service are
Hannah Brooks and Deborah Affleck. Thank you both. So can I now move on and look at the resolutions? Item one is to receive the report of the directors, the annual accounts and the auditors report. I therefore propose that the directors report, annual accounts and the auditors report are received. Item two is to approve the directors remuneration report. This report is included at pages 24 and 25 of the annual report and was also included in the review of the year which was sent to members with the notice of this AGM. The report sets out our approach to remuneration of our executive and non-executive directors and there have been no substantive changes to our approach this year. Non-executive directors receive a basic fee and standard expenses for attending meetings with a supplementary payment for holding key statutory positions, especially as chairman of the committee. Executive directors receive a basic salary, which is reviewed on an annual basis and can also benefit from a performance related pay scheme if set targets are achieved. Now, while we're not required to seek your approval for this report, we do think that it is in the interests of good governance and transparency that members do have a say. I therefore propose that the director's remuneration report is approved. And could I please have a seconder? I second this. Thank you very much. Item three is to reappoint BDO LLP as auditor. An annual requirement for this meeting is for you to consider and if thought fit to pass an ordinary resolution to reappoint our auditors. I propose therefore that the society reappoints BDO LLP as auditor. And again, could I please have a seconder? I second that chairman. Thank you very much. Item four is to elect and if necessary re-elect the society's directors. Our rules require that directors appointed during the year are required to be elected by the members at the following AGM. I therefore propose that Paul Johnson and Sean Hill are elected as directors and that Steve Little and Alan Harris are all re-elected as directors. Again, could I please have a seconder? I second this. Thank you. Item five is a special resolution to amend the society's rules to allow for virtual, virtual meetings to take place as required. Please, could I have a seconder? I second that, Chairman. Thank you. And thank you also very much to all of our members who have voted at this AGM. And as we did last year, despite the levels and the difficulties of the current pandemic, we've had a high level of voting from you all. We very much look forward to returning to our usual member events and to more normal AGM arrangements sometime and somehow in the second half of the year. I will now ask Rebecca, our company secretary, to give you the results of the voting for today. Thank you, Alan. So the results for the first resolution to receive the report of the directors, the annual accounts and the auditors reports. Votes in favour, 2,924, and votes against, 24. To approve the Director's Remuneration Report, 2,719 votes in favour, and 187 votes against. To appoint BDO as auditors, 2,875 votes in favour, and 59 votes against. To elect Sean Hill as a Director of the Society, 2,862 votes for and 73 votes against. To elect Paul Johnson as a director of the society, 2,851 votes for and 67 votes against. To re-elect Alan Harris, 2,854 votes in favour and 77 votes against. And to re-elect Steve Little, 2,848 votes in favour and 81 against. And finally, to approve the amendments to the rules of the society, 2,844 votes in favour and 78 votes against. Thank you very much, Rebecca. 
I declare BDO LLP duly appointed as the Society's auditor. I declare that Alan Harris, Steve Little, Sean Hill and Paul Johnson are elected as directors. I declare that the Society's rules are amended to allow virtual meetings as required. All of these results are available on our website. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your support in these difficult times. I now formally close the 2021 Annual General Meeting. And I have the pleasure to hand back now to Fiona, who will introduce our final video, which is all about the vote we passed at last year's AGM, making the name and brand change into a reality. Thanks, Alan. So, as Alan said, the final part of today is to share with you our new brand and logo for Suffolk Building Society, which will launch across the society in October. As you've already heard, in March 2020, the society's members voted overwhelmingly in favour of changing from Ipswich Building Society to Suffolk Building Society. But this is much more than just a name change and a new logo. As Richard's explained, it has given us the opportunity to really think about what makes our society different, what our name and brand stand for now, and in the future as we implement our digital strategy and connect with even more members beyond the county boundaries. Over the past year, we've spoken to intermediaries, branch staff and members to help develop our new brand proposition and identify our associated brand values. We'll be working on embedding these across the society in coming months as we prepare for the brand rollout in the autumn, including the relaunch of our website. Our members are at the heart of everything we do, and we exist to benefit our members, not shareholders. So although we will be launching new digital initiatives in the near future, it's imperative we don't lose sight of our purpose or our values. We aim to be easy to do business with, be present in the community, and will be available in person when you need us. The new branding and name herald the start of the next chapter of this society's story. We hope you enjoy the video and thanks again for joining us today. We are the Suffolk Building Society and we are where we're from. For over 170 years, we've done what we can to make Suffolk life a good life. You'll find our branches on high streets from Sudbury to Saxmundham. You'll find our initials on the houses we helped build. You'll find our passbooks passed down through generations. We're changing our name to reflect our broader horizons and we're on a journey to appeal to more people than ever before. Changing how we look to capture the vibrance and values of our home. But rest assured that while a lot of things are changing, our commitment to our members and communities are not. We're still putting members at the heart of what we do. And the stories we tell. Still doing everything we can to be where people need us with the services they need, in branches, on the phone and online. A vibrant society, not dull and faceless, never losing our personality. Still proud to say that community isn't where we are, it's how we are. A promise we've been keeping for over 170 years.